what is it about insurance that brings out the devil in us? In insurance, the people who are defrauding the insurance company are people like you and me, people who self-conceive as upstanding citizens. And if you chart their behavior, it's generally good, 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 until they make an insurance claim and then they let the devil out and then they go back to being good, 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 good. And that is a fascinating phenomena. Everything that you ought not to do if you want honest behavior is manifested in insurance companies. Um, the win-lose proposition, asymmetry of information, you have no idea what your policy says, I know what it says. Asymmetry of power, you've already given me the money, now you want to take it back. All, all these things make us feel entitled to embellish and lie because we feel like the playing field isn't even. And if the playing field isn't even, I've got to start high to get to where I deserve to get to. And it's kind of that that we took a run at. We wanted to see if there was a way to change the game. Hey, Mike, great to see you this morning. Let me introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Daniel Shriver. I'm one of the founders and CEOs of Lemonade and your friend of these 30-something years. Could you imagine? For a 25-year-old guy like you, that's pretty amazing. It's impressive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Counterintuitive. <laughs> the joke is you actually look 25. Oh, but, that's yeah. so kind Look at of me you. with my... I used to call it salt and pepper, but it's just salt. Now it's yeah. wisdom. Wisdom, that's right. Wisdom. Well, great. I am so excited to welcome Daniel Schreiber, co-founder and co-CEO of Lemonade, the AI-powered insurance company driven by social impact. It's actually driven by profits and as a byproduct of an aligned business model, which we'll talk about, also delivers a lot of social impact. Lemonade is the fastest growing insurance company in the world right now. And full disclosure, as Daniel mentioned, Daniel and I have been friends for over 30 years and Olaf was the first investor in Lemonade. I'll get to Daniel's prior background in a second, but first, I want to share two amazing statistics about Lemonade. They hit 1 million paying customers faster than Netflix, Spotify, or Amazon, and 5 to 10 times faster than the most formidable insurers in the United States, Allstate, Geico, State Farm, USAA, and at a 150% compound annual growth rate, their top line accelerated faster in the first five years of operation than Facebook, Amazon, or Apple. Prior to co-founding Lemonade in 2015, Daniel served as president and a member of the board of directors of PowerMat Technologies, a wireless charging solutions and technology company. Before that, he was at SanDisk. And Daniel is a serial entrepreneur whose first company, Alchemedia, an internet security software company, which I was also fortunate to be an investor in, less fortunate than in Lemonade, uh, was acquired by Finjohn Software in 2002. Daniel is also a trained commercial lawyer he holds a Bachelor of Laws and First Class Honors from King's College of London. Daniel, we're so happy to have you on the show with us. Let's get started. So first question I have to ask just for our listeners uh, is how do we know each other? So if memory serves, and it often doesn't, um, we, in, back in 1989, I want to say, were uh, fellow students in the Haaretzion Yeshiva in Gush Etzion in Israel. I came from the UK, you came from the US, and we met in Israel. And somehow we still managed to communicate despite the different accents and upbringings. Amazing when you get thrown in for two years in a place together. Desperate times, desperate measures. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember all of uh, uh, the British uh, young people who came saying, could you pass the serviettes? And I said, what is a serviette? Lives and learns. It's a napkin there for those go. who don't know. <laughs> so um, let's talk about, we'll start with Lemonade, which is the most recent uh, endeavor of yours. Uh, I'd love to hear, because I know it, uh, how you connected with Shai in the early days and what were those early days like? Because you didn't know each other before. Sure. Um, I was coming off of a, a stint at a company called Powermat, which you mentioned earlier, and I was on what they called gardening leave. I'd given in my notice, but they paid me to do nothing, which is a very privileged position to be in. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do next. Um, and I stumbled upon insurance. It was actually at, at Singularity University. I was primed. I was looking proactively for kind of which industry I thought could be ripe for disruption. And I actually was pretty deep down a path in the medical space. And then listening to Peter Diamandis talk, he mentioned, I don't remember what the question was. I don't remember what the answer was, but he mentioned in passing peer-to-peer -peer insurance. And I was kind of all wound up to look for the, and I latched onto that and started developing what in due course became Lemonade. Um, and as it was morphing and taking shape in my mind, I sought out just a, a handful of people and you were one of them. And I met you for a coffee in Jerusalem. And I said to you, hey, 
I'm at a cafe on, that's no longer there, but, le- but lemonade is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I kind of said to you, at least this is my recollection of the meeting, I said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of peer-to-peer insurance. And I think you stopped me there and you said, that has legs. You, you kind of the, you, the pass the sniff test. And as you are wont to do, you started rattling off action items for me. Yeah. And you listed like five people that I have to meet. And Shai was one of them. And Shai and I met... Um, just a few meters from here on a coffee shop just down this very road um, in February of 2015. So actually almost to the day um, eight years ago. And um, one thing led to another. And then we we founded Lemonade, came back to see you. Aleph was uh, not only the, um, the the force that introduced us, but then um, our first backer as well. The kind of a funny twist in the tail is that once we started going with Lemonade, I reached out to Peter Diamandis and we met for coffee in New York and I said, Peter, I'm doing that thing that you spoke about in that. And he said to me, no, no, I met something totally different. He had some <laughs> idea about genetic pooling for health insurance. So I like to quit that Lemonade was one big misunderstanding. <laughs> Peter Diamandis, for those who don't know, is like the founder of the XPRIZE and involved in Singularity, if I remember correctly, right, yeah. and a special person. So um, on this podcast, you're the first of the entrepreneurs on whose board I seen I sit. And so I want to ask you a question. There's a lot in the Twitter sphere these days about uh, investors who do more harm than good. I'd like to ask you how I've harmed you. And you can be honest. I have license to be honest. Okay. We know each other long enough. Um, coming into to Lemonade, I, I've and you know, I, I've been around the park a couple of times and and I I share the perspective that investors tend to do more harm than good. I think that there are investors who truly add value and they are a small minority. There's a bulk of investors who think they add value but don't and they are the most dangerous. And then there's dumb money that knows it's dumb and is passive and they're great as well. Um, But the danger is really the bulk in the middle, people who are sure that they know better than the entrepreneurs and they add a lot of value and they just just don't. Um, And coming into Lemonade, I kind of, resign myself that the chances of finding those outstanding investors was low enough that the safe bet would be to go to the other extreme and just find dumb money that knows it's dumb, at least it self-identifies in a clear way. (laughs) Um, And I was wrong. I've changed my perspective because at Lemonade, both you and I have to say all of our investors fall into that far left end of that spectrum where we've just been blessed by investors who are um, active in appropriate ways, trusting and passive in appropriate ways and unrelentlessly or relentlessly uh, um, smart and additive. If I try to answer your question and take it more seriously, I, I, my sense... I mean, you weren't serious about what you just said right now? I, I'm going to try and highlight your shortcomings. I would like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've had conversations with other founders who ask me about you, and, and I say to them what I just said, but I add that um, your, your bark is worse than your bite that sometimes you will say things with tremendous conviction and it can be daunting for inve- for founders, particularly for younger ones. And they can feel like if they don't do what you say, they'll be clashing with a key investor or you, know, you will think badly of them as a result of that. And that's just not the case. You like to talk about opinions that are loosely held. Um, uh, and I think that's true, but there's a stylistic thing that sometimes gets in the way, the, the kind of brash New Yorker in you... <laughs> <laughs> can intimidate founders who, who don't understand the style of a substance issue of that. Thank you. Too it's much good. candor? No, it's great <laughs> feedback. You know, one of, the, one of the purposes of this podcast is, is to, you know, talk about not just values, but how we can provide more value to the community and of, of CEOs and entrepreneurs and portfolios. And I think that's great feedback. So turning the tables, uh, what did you get wrong in the early days of Lemonade that you think could have gone uh, better like, what could you have done differently? Uh, I have to confess, I'm not very good at the reflective stuff. Honestly, I'm not. Um, I was chatting to one of my colleagues and... Um, Turns she, out, based on what you said about me, that I'm not either. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a voracious consumer of feedback, and I just admire it so much because she's constantly seeking it. And I said to you, you know, I've never asked you for feedback about me. She says, I give you feedback the whole time. I said, that's true, but it's unsolicited. <laughs> <laughs> So I confess, I, I tend to be kind of forward thinking and I don't tend to be very reflective. So one thing is I, I will make a lot of mistakes and miss them um, and not dwell on them and kind of push on. And I'm also a little bit suspicious of 
the whole endeavor in these kind of things because you don't get a clear A B test. Yeah. So you make your decisions under conditions of uncertainty. In retrospect, you say, oh, that was a mistake, that was a mistake. But if the same circumstances repeated, would it be a mistake to make the same, to kind of roll the dice in the same fashion? So I'm a bit cautious about that. That said, there are things that we patently got wrong. Um, I mentioned earlier peer-to-peer -peer insurance, and we branded the company that way in the early days, and it was misbranding. It, it was a, We were left-footed, flat-footed, whatever you want, going into a launch by describing ourselves in that fashion. In retrospect, because the whole peer-to-peer -peer world got a bad reputation, and at the time peer-to-peer -peer lending was a big thing, and that fell on its face. But also because we got dinged both from all-time insurance people that said, hey, all of insurance is peer-to-peer, -peer, this isn't differentiated, and others who said this isn't truly peer-to-peer, -peer, and it just created a, a, um, a distraction that was unwarranted. And we made umpteen such mistakes as, as you go along. Um, but that's one that springs to mind. So I'm really interested in the first thing you said, which is uh, how much do you dwell on mistakes? I've, I've written uh, in my most recent book in Hebrew, which is about uncertainty, and uh, all through Corona, COVID times, I was giving lectures, I probably gave a lecture 40 to 50 times on the difference between risk management and uncertainty. And unfortunately, I think most people get wrong what kind of circumstances they're in. Are they in an uncertainty moment or in a risk management moment? And when I hear you say, I don't dwell too much on mistakes, I just kind of go forward, so to speak, keep driving through, making more bets, seeing which ones turn out feels like the right approach to uncertainty. And so I want to double click. You're a founder. You're a CEO of a startup. Is there any moment of risk management in a startup where you kind of got to hedge your bets? Or is it all uncertainty? Keep going forward. Damn the torpedoes. Uh, don't dwell too much on the mistakes. They don't matter. We just kind of kind of keep rolling forward and be optimistic that the next one will turn out better. I think there's... For every founder, every company, every manager, there's risk management dimensions to, the, to their job. There's no question. Um, but so much more in a company that is in the business of risk management. Lemonade is an insurance company. Um, so understanding risks, quantifying risks, managing risks is the very core of what our business is all about. Um, I find maybe we'll come back to this in a different context, but sometimes people confuse quantification of risk with a prescience. They think, oh, if I can use data science to figure out how likely a car is to crash, that's the same as knowing whether it will crash, and it isn't. Um, I can tell you with certainty what the odds are if you go into a roulette table and place everything on number 27. Um, that doesn't mean I know whether 27 will come up. I just know the odds. And if you repeat that enough times, then uh, I'll be able to predict the swarm of bees, but not the bee specifically. And I think the same is true in a, a lot of these events. So yes, risk management is a core part of what we're doing. It's not just about placing bets. We are, you mentioned COVID and we took some corrective measures as soon as that struck and the world changed in ways that were uncertain, but also presented risks that we felt we could navigate around or at least reduce our exposure to them. And that was true again now as the market took its downturn, inflation started soaring and we've taken corrective measures to adjust our risk profile in, in view of things that we can identify. My partner at Benchmark, Bruce Dunleavy, used to say that startups or something like this, if this goes right and this goes right and this goes right and that goes right, then you've got a really big outcome. And so it's like a stringing together of 27 on the roulette table. It's more than that, obviously. It's not luck. But you got to kind of get a lot of very unlikely but high impact things right. That's obviously different from risk management. It's on some level prescience. How do you kind of keep getting those things right? when you're in this very uncertain environment? I think a bit differently to, to how your partner framed it. Um, I once came across, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but this calculation that spoke about um, a pool table or snooker table. And you hit one ball, you have some predictability about where it's going to go. You try to do a fancy maneuver hitting a ball into a ball, that's tough. A ball into a ball into a ball, you better be a world-class expert. And the calculation was that I think it was by the time you get to eight balls, one hitting the other, hitting the other, hitting the other, you have to take into account the gravitational pull of like every atom in the universe. The sensitivity becomes so intense um, that- Now I know I was never able to hit eight balls into the pocket at a time. That explains yeah. it. Um, and I, I think that that's germane to your question because I actually don't think you can predict too many moves in advance. Um, I read a fabulous book, I, I forget the name of the author, um, The Mission, The Men, and me, the mission, the men, and I, something like that. And it was about 
some Delta Force commando who had all these different operations, but he spoke about dealing with those kinds of uncertainties because he's sent to get Bin Laden and he knows what resources he has. He's got his squad and he's got his capabilities, but he doesn't know where the guy is. He doesn't know what he's going to encounter. Was it Mike Tyson who said everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face? Um, Punched. Punched in the face, okay. So this kind of idea that you can, it's true that when we present to VCs business plans, you see it neatly lined up. If this, then that, then this is that, this, then that. And it's it's beautiful and it all makes sense. And I understand why your partner would have said that. But I think from my point of view, it's different. It's we want to find a way to the West. And what we do is we've got a map and we've got a team and we don't actually know how we're going to get there. But what we believe is that the capabilities that we've gathered will get us to the destination, will give us the tools to, to deal with the things as they come up, which is not quite the same as having it all planned out. Yeah. No, I don't think Bruce intended that it's all planned out, but, you know, all these string of events need to happen uh, along the way. But, you know, one of those events in the case of Lemonade was going public. So Lemonade went public in 2020. Uh, I love the picture of uh, you and your co-founder and co-CEO Shai and your wives all alone ringing the bell of the New York Stock Exchange with masks on. Uh, that, I think, is a picture that will be seared in my memory forever uh, as a testament both to fortitude, your fortitude, and the pandemic. Um, but it was just five years after the founding of the company, um, which I think at least today is considered relatively fast uh, for any company. And so I want to hit a couple of things. One, what led to the, what led to the decision uh, to go public? Um, it feels like in that kind of, this needs to go right and that needs to go right. Certainly in the time we're in now of tougher public markets, that turns out to have been an incredibly prescient decision where the company uh, built up its cash reserves to go through this this period, continue growing and, and, and improving the business. And so both prospectively and retrospectively to the, you know, to the extent you can, why go public? What are the advantages of being public? How do you think about that in a competitive context right now? It's great. And, and you are... Um really the moving force behind us going public. Uh, it wouldn't have happened if we didn't all follow your lead, but it was really your leadership that, that um, drove Thank us. Thank God there. that time my bark wasn't worse than my bike. <laughs> yeah, it was that brash of New York. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> um, but it's true, you were, you were the force that moved us there. I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled that we did it. And we should talk a little bit about some of the things that are necessary in order to be thrilled even when our stock is down 90%. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but, you know, when we went public in 2015, it was uh, in 2020, 2020, it was off of the back of a year where there were some failed IPOs and some spectacular pullbacks. We work almost went public um, and kind of crashed the whole market. We were preparing to go public ourselves at that time. And it, the the demise of that IPO um, rattled a lot of markets and really shut the, the window on IPOs for a good half a year or nine months. Um but it was to me, and Uber had gone public and done not very well, and yep. et cetera. And for me, it was a reminder that some of these companies have reached these huge dimensions. Uber was a, a, a stunningly large company by the time I went public. And that was a, something of a novelty. Um, companies that the best known tech companies, the Apples, the Amazons, the Microsofts, um, they went public much earlier. They went public when they had about $100 million of ARR or of revenue, which is the size that we were at in 2020. Um, and they did it after four or five years, which was the age that we were at. And in 1999, I think the average age for going public was something like four years old in 99. And in 2009, it was about 14 years old. And that big change, at least one of the forces that had changed it is that a lot of late stage money had to come in. Famously, the SoftBank fund, but then that was mirrored by others. And suddenly you could raise a billion dollars without having to go public. And that hadn't happened before. And I kind of asked myself whether that was a, a good thing, whether those companies that stayed public, private for longer, of course, it's sheltered, you don't have the exposure, there's a lot of coziness to it. But doesn't that just lead to a kind of um, late adolescence that <laughs> these 30 year old uh, kids who are still at home and never really learned how to survive on their own, never really took off. And I think that some of that was happening in the tech sector as well. You have such a sheltered upbringing that by the time you go public, you're, you really haven't developed the resilience. And the I think you taught me this, but the public markets resent you for it because you haven't shared that growth with them. 
you heaved yourself onto the market after the exciting stuff was behind you, and then you get into a bad cycle with them as well. So for all of those reasons, I think it was great that we went public when we did. Certainly, the volatility is going to be greater for any company in the public markets, for a young company, so much more so. Um, but it's been spectacular for us. The, the one thing I was going to add is um, I kind of swore to myself and to my partner and to everybody else that I wasn't going to let the stock and the quarter manage the business. And my big relief and surprise is that I've managed to keep that promise. I, I didn't really believe it when I made that promise to myself. <laughs> um, and I get people the whole time asking me if I'm okay. <laughs> the, and I'm genuinely okay. I'm genuinely okay that the company is running, it's is being run with a focus on customers, not on stock price, on the growth and the long term rather than the short term and, and what analysts are or are not saying. And it's a great relief to me. And I think if you're not able to do that, you really do have to think twice and three times about being public because I can see how it particularly markets like these could send a founder into a dark place. I, I'm I'm Really pleased that that's not happened to us. And amazingly, you haven't lost anyone from your management team. Everyone is still there and and pulling and, and inspired. But you mentioned at the beginning of those last remarks, kind of 90% down in the stock price. I'm still a shareholder, a large one. Uh, that's still tough to manage through, right? Uh, you may not pay attention to the stock price, but other people do. And, you know, there's, there's posts about it and tweets about it. And uh, I'm sure it's a discussion. What are some of the... Uh, methods you use to kind of lead the management team and, and, and lemonade employees through that? It's not as tough as your question implies. Not for me. Um, I, in, in a profound way, I don't care. Now, I care, but in, in a profound way, I don't care. I care in a superficial way. And the reason I, I really don't care, and I think this is true of a, a lot of the topics that we're going to touch on, I think the time horizons matter a great deal. Whenever you think about values, time horizons matter. What's the right thing to do? The answer is always going to be dependent on the time horizon at which you look at things. Um, and my time horizons are such that the volatility and vicissitudes of the short term um, kind of pass me by. That they're, They intrigue me. I, I look at them almost with disinterest, <laughs> certainly with a degree of dispassion that surprises me. Because I'm really focused on what's going to be in five or 10 years, not what's going to be in five or 10 days. And if that's your perspective, then it's almost a, a topic of, of little interest. Now, there are practical things. It becomes more expensive to raise money. So absolutely, we have adjusted our spend to accommodate the, the fact that now money is more expensive. When things are more dear, you spend less of them. Um, it's affected our compensation structures because options that are deeply underwater are not attractive and you have to compensate for them. So it definitely raises practical issues with which you have to contend, but perhaps less emotional ones than you might expect. So you've said often that this is a business that's hundreds of years old and most of the insurance companies are over 100 years old, you know, lovable names like Geico and Allstate and State Farm, et cetera. It's a very competitive business, very competitive business. And you talked a second ago about long-termism. And I remember something I heard from Jeff Bezos 20 something years ago in which he said, um, there's people buy things all the time. A lot more people are going to buy them online over the coming decades. Like this is going to be okay. How do you think about that in the lemonade context, which is there's all this competition. They spent a ton of money to acquire customers, these legacy insurance companies. State Farm even ran an ad poking fun at lemonade's bot. I mean, which to me, by the way, meant we arrived. A TV ad with two NBA stars uh, making fun of bots. But still, the competition is fierce. W what about the trend do you think is your friend? How do you think about competition in general? And why do you think you'll outrun them? And the one word answer is technology. Um, technology is upending loads of businesses, Jeff Bezos among others. But I think in insurance, it stands to transform the business in ways that not many industries are as vulnerable to it. Um, and by the way, not many industries have survived as long as they have without that kind of transformation. Yeah. So businesses that were founded as all were that you, you kind of mentioned in the era of the horse-drawn carriage were there's nothing wrong with their longevity, but I often say longevity is not the same as immortality. Yes. <laughs> but being old just means that you were founded in a time that was optimal for the era in which you were founded. 
and the world has changed. Sometimes lemonade is talked of as a disruptor. I don't love the moniker because I don't think we're causing the disruption. The disruption is the fact that the world has changed and that insurance companies are not well structured for the world in which they find themselves. And changing DNA is a, is a trick that no company has really figured out. So you've got a DNA that's suitable for a bygone era in terms of your risk aversion, in terms of your business model, your agent-based distribution networks, et cetera, et cetera, your investor base. Everything is suited for a particular world, and then the world changes. That creates opportunities for companies that don't have all of that legacy. And that really is the thesis of Lemonade, is that insurance could be done a lot better with technology. Now, every line in the PL can be done better. If you replace brokers with bots, you cut out 15 to 20% of the cost structure, that's a pretty big deal. And by the way, you delight consumers because you pay claims in three seconds rather than in three weeks. You get an NPS hit and a cost saving, that's dramatic. And every line that you go through the PL that's true of, you get a better experience for less cost, better experience for less cost. But it runs deeper in insurance because in insurance, the ultimate product is probability theory, right? We mentioned this earlier. Insurance is the business of quantifying risk. And data allows you to do that in a way that nobody else or, or nothing else can. So that bot is not only delighting consumers, it's generating something like 100 times more data points than the equivalent human broker. That is a structural advantage that will manifest ever more powerfully over time. So it means that not only can we delight consumers for a lower cost, but we can quantify risk in a way that competitors cannot. And I think that even more powerfully than the kind of feedback loop that Jeff Bezos spoke about is foundational because here you're changing not merely how people buy things, but the very thing that they buy. There are other upstart competitors. There was Root, Metro Mile, who you just acquired, uh, Hippo. Lemonade has ran past them quite candidly, I think it's fair to say. Why? There are other upstarts. What about Lemonade? Tackle this old structurally inefficient industry better than some of these other ones. So candidly, I think there's a handful of things that, that I would point to, and here there is a bit of retrospective uh, whatever. Finally. <laughs> One that will sound um, perhaps odd, but is we have Shai Winninga. <laughs> um, my co-founder is, um, is a phenomenon. Um, and I've had the good fortune of meeting people like Jeff Bezos and all of other people and I worked for a bunch of years in Silicon Valley and in other places. And uh, I wrote a, a, a blog post about this and I met Steve Jobs and all that. If I had to choose between any of them and my co-founder, Shai Winninger, I'd choose Shai time and again. And the stuff that he did in the early days of Lemonade, the branding, the product work, the precision um, is something that's just extraordinary. I think it's head and shoulders above anything that I've had the privilege uh, to, to work with in the past. So I think that's a, a powerful thing, particularly, particularly, particularly in the foundational stages as you're thinking about the business. Um, another thing that we did is um, we decided pretty early on that we were going to be multi-product. Um, it's striking to me that all of our insurtech competitors have chosen a different path. So Oscar is just doing health and Root is just doing car and Metromile was just doing car and Hippo is really just doing um, property, et cetera. Um, and we genuinely wish them well because our success is not dependent on the failure of anybody else. This is a vast market. Um, we're competing with the incumbents, not with, with them. Um, but I do struggle to figure out how you're ever going to make it if you're not offering multiple products. So we do, and I think that's a, an important differentiator. And so as I think about it, you know, our differentiation from incumbents is technology. Our differentiation from technology companies is multi-product more than anything else. Yeah, but Geico is a single-line company, right? They just do car. They do and they don't. It's a... Uh, they have a hybrid model. If you go onto the website, they'll sell you home. They'll right. advertise home. From other people. That's right. They'll resell other. From, at an insurance plumbing level, they just do car. Right. Um, but from a consumer-facing perspective, they'll sell you everything. Yeah, that's fair. So one of the unique things about Lemonade is what I would call business model alignment. Uh, I'll put it in my own words, which is uh, legacy insurance companies make money when they make you more miserable. Uh, you're in your time of need, you had a flood, God forbid, fire, car accident, and they try everything possible to deny your claim because uh, they make their profit over the leftovers. You chose from the outset, one of the things that attracted me, a 
call it flat fee, more sassy uh, business model, where you don't make any more money because the claims are denied. And then he said, uh, whatever's left, uh, we'll give to the charity of the consumer's uh, choice. So congratulations if you want to be a fraudulent consumer of this insurance company. You will have uh, stolen money from the American Cancer Society or something like that. And that uh, aligns behavior. Is that a fair description of your business model choice? Sure. Okay. Um, other companies get involved in, uh, let's call it charitable or not-for-profit endeavors as well. They have something called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Can you help me understand the difference between Lemonade's business model and the business model for argument's sake of uh, Geico or State Farm and their corporate social responsibility arm? Yeah, I, I think at a at a foundational level, what we're trying to achieve is enlightened self-interest. In other words, we're trying to solve a business problem through charitable giving. We've never apologized to our investors or excused the donations that we've made. We're a young company, we've donated over $6 million um, to charity. Um, and the reason we never feel the need to excuse it is because we think it's actually accretive to shareholder value. Now that's counterintuitive, but insurance is plagued by dishonesty and fraud. And it's an unusual kind of fraud. A lot of online businesses are plagued by fraud and typically it's some hackers from some foreign country who steal your credit cards and that's what we associate with the name fraud. Phishing campaigns, stuff like that. In, in insurance, it's different. In insurance, the people who are defrauding the insurance company are people like you and me, people who self-conceive as upstanding citizens. And if you chart their behavior, it's generally good, 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 until they make an insurance claim and then they let the devil out and then they go back to being good, 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 good. And that is a fascinating phenomena. And in the very early days of Lemonade, we sought out experts in game theory and in behavioral economics. And I hounded um, Professor Kahneman until he agreed to, to chat to me. And Dan Ariely joined our founding team. And it was really to try and understand that exact question. What is it about insurance that brings out the devil in us? And at a, at a mathematical level, insurance is about a community of people pooling their resources to help their weakest member in the hour of need. That is almost the definition of a charity. That's the International Red Cross kind of thing, right? Um, and yet the perception of insurance couldn't be more removed from that if you, if you tried. And Shai and I were just, as newcomers to the space, uh, fascinated by that. And Dan had recently completed a book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. And after 10 years of researching this, he kind of concluded that if you set out to create a system to bring out the worst in humanity, it would look a lot like a modern insurance company. Everything that you ought not to do if you want honest behavior is manifested in insurance companies. Um, the win-lose proposition that you just, zero-sum game that you just described, asymmetry of information, you have no idea what your policy says, I know what it says, asymmetry of power, you've already given me the money, now you want to take it back. All, all these things make us feel entitled to embellish and lie because we feel like the playing field isn't even. And if the playing field isn't even, I've got to start high to get to where I deserve to get to. And it's kind of that that we took a run at. We wanted to see if there was a way to change the game using game theory nomenclature and move, change it from being a two-person conflicted game to a three-person game. And the charity is really that third person that changes the very nature of the game. So for us, signaling that, hey, we're going to cap our profits. We're going to cap them at 25% gross margin. We're not going to exceed that. And if there's ever an opportunity to take more than that, we won't. We're going to tie our hands and that money will go to a charity. That's an important signal for us. It changes our incentives. It puts that money that poisons the well beyond our reach. Um, but it also invites you to change your mindset, to think about the nature of the interaction differently. And rather than thinking about it as a conflicted relationship, where you have to defend yourself, you are suddenly thinking, hey, one second, that charity that I chose, it's that that will suffer the consequences of my actions. And a victimless crime is suddenly no longer a victimless crime. So for all of those reasons, when we give charity, we feel like we're adding shareholder value. We're resolving a business challenge, which is the deep fraud and dishonesty that plagues the industry. There are concentric circles beyond that. There's low loyalty, low brand affinity, high cost of acquisition, and all of these to some extent, tie back to that same fundamental problem of distrust. You know, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, who is the leader of the German Jewish community in the 19th century, 
has this line that he calls the third person among them, or the third among them. He refers to, uh, after the first portion of Leviticus, he says that uh, the broker of dishonesty in loans and partnership is God, who he refers to as the third among them. You need a third party to kind of change the playing field from an animal spirits Hmm. playing field to one where there's what to lose in a different context. And that's what your description just reminded me of. But it brings me to a, a, another question, which is, it feels like the way you describe most insurance companies is that they think most people are bad, at least in their moment of need. They're not bad people, but they're bad. And it feels like you think most people are good. We just need to change the incentive system or the playing field so that it ensures that they continue to be good even in a moment of need. Is that is that fair? No. No, okay. No. Do you think most people are good? I'm kind of naive that way. I, I do tend to <laughs> tend to think that way. But I, I I think that the game matters more than the players. And that's true on both sides of the equation. So if you I, I my moral fiber is no way better than that of any other insurance executive. I believe that. I, I I've met a lot of them. I think they're fiercely impressive people and good moral people. I was actually talking about the consumers, not yeah, the insurance yeah, executives. Uh, yeah. But that the kind of mirror images. So what happens is if you put somebody in a position where the incentives are distorting, then they will behave in a way that's distorted. And I think that's true for consumers as well. So if you present them in a way where they feel like they're they're being screwed and that they haven't got the power asymmetry is dis disabling for them and that they need to do something in order to recapture the power, then we'll all behave in a way that you and me uh, um, included. Whereas if you signal to them that they're in a different kind of environment, then they will think differently about it. There's, um, there's a wonderful book written in the 1970s about uh, blood donation. Um, and it was comparing the then commonplace practice about blood donation in the UK and in the US and contrasting the two. And in the UK, people donated blood and in the US, people donated blood. But in the US, in addition to whatever psychic gratification you got for being a good person and donating blood, they also gave you a few bucks. And that was the contrast that people were, were studying. And strikingly, in classic economic theory, you would say that whatever incentives exist in the UK, they're on steroids in the US because they exist. And then you get some dollars as well. Wow, everybody should be donating blood, but it doesn't work that way. What happened is that in the US, fewer people donated blood and the quality of the blood was lower. Why is that? Because as soon as you add the financial incentive, I change it in people's minds. It shifts from being a values-driven activity, I feel good about myself because I went to give blood, and you've actually polluted that by making it transactional. You've reduced it by making it transactional. Those $5 that I get are not additive. They actually subtract from the, from the nature of the commitment. And suddenly I ask myself, hey, I'm a busy guy. Do I really want to go and give blood for five bucks rather than thinking, do I want to go and give blood to help people? And my answer is no, I'm not going to do that for a few bucks. Who, who answers that yes? A lot of the homeless people with various illnesses and stuff like that, they'll answer yes. So the quality of the blood goes down and they will lie on their forms because they're pursuing the $5 and not anything else. And so the quality is, is suffers. My point is, interactions can be cataloged in our minds in one of two ways. And it's not entirely binary, but it has a, that feel to it where I can think about, am I doing something meaningful or am I doing something transactional? And insurance, the way it's structured today, forces us into the transactional mode. What we're trying to do is to allow more and more consumers to feel like their claim and the whole interaction has a values dimension to it. And as I say, I think that that is ultimately self-serving and serving of shareholder value as well. Have you asked people, surveyed our customers at Lemonade and said, uh, do you feel differently being a Lemonade customer versus your previous insurer? I'm not sure that we've run that exact survey. We do monitor um, things like Net Promoter Score, which yeah. is an evidence of how you feel, and their Lemonade is standout. I would just caution because so much about the way you interact with Lemonade is different, that this is not a clean test which right. isolates this one dimension. Right. So as you know from me, I have this theory that values create economic value, create value. Um, this would seem to be a clear indication of that, right? Fraud should go down. Over time, stickiness to the product should go up. Customer happiness goes up, word of mouth goes up, so marketing costs go down. Can you see that empirically yet in the business? 
I think we absolutely can. But again, I want to put an asterisk next to that because there is no clear A-B test here. So when you change so many parameters, you know, we, we have a bot interacting with you instead of an agent and it's all smiley and pink rather than a grumpy agent and other things. And that's not about the values. Yeah. So we've changed, our prices are more attractive. Um, so many of the things, we've really reinvented a lot of the aspects. So I do think we are seeing evidence of that. For example, we see um, constantly consumers returning money that they've received because the item showed up. So That's we'll amazing. Yes, yeah, so we'll get somebody writing in, hey, my girlfriend found my laptop or watch or whatever, it was under the, the couch. Um, and the old timers from insurance on our staff are amazed because it's just that they've done 30 years in traditional insurance companies. And do people, they say this kind of overtly uh, because I know the leftovers go to charity or is it we subconscious? We do get that sometimes. You do? We do. We yeah. do get that sometimes, yeah. So th those things, I want to be careful not to read too much into that because it's anecdotal, mm -hmm. but we are seeing a lot of anecdotes. So you've said before, um, and I know you're inspired by Churchill in this regard, that uh, storytelling is really important and how you speak about it is very important. Churchill said he spent an hour for every one minute of speech. I think I've heard you say multiple times. Tell the entrepreneurs out there why storytelling is so important and why they need to invest so many hours in telling the story of their company. There's really nothing else in the early stages of a company. Um, and I do find oftentimes that it's under underrated, but I, I think if you look at some of the great entrepreneurs um, that we all know, that's really been central to, to how they created value. I don't think I'll say anything particularly novel or controversial if I'll say that the role of an entrepreneur in, particularly in the early stages, but not just, is to envisage or envision a, a future that doesn't exist. Entrepreneurship is not about just repeating the, something that already exists. It's about, in some form or fashion, changing the world. That can sound grandiose. It doesn't have to be grandiose. But if there's no change involved, then it's really not entrepreneurship. So you have to be able to take the present and describe a future that doesn't exist and contrast the two. Then you have to explain how you're going to get from here to there. And then you have to convince, you know, with those snooker balls or whatever, that if this, then that, then that, then that. And that's how I will create this, this new future. But in the early days, it's about not merely envisag envisaging that future, but being able to communicate it in a palpable way such that you reduce your dependence on the imagination of the listener. In other words, you want the person who's listening to you to be able to see in a textured, multidimensional, rich way the future and be able to sense it and believe in it such that they say, yeah, wow, I, I can see it. I, I would love that future and I will invest in creating that future. And that is the role of the entrepreneur. If, if you're down to um, excels and just showing how things could play out, but you're not helping, by the way, not just investors, but potential employees, potential customers, reporters, if you're not telling a story, then you're really missing it out. Missing out, yeah. In your recent shareholder letters, apropos that, it just came back to my mind now, you've been using the metaphor of uh, the cost of gas and miles per gallon. I'm sure I'll do injustice to, to your metaphor, so I'll let you tell it in a second. Um, talk about the metaphor for a second and, and, and why are you using that to describe your insurance business? Well, it, it ties back into your question earlier about the stock uh, price. Um, and I said that the cost of money has risen. And what the way we articulated this in the letter is that um, we're on a journey and we need gas to get there. And gas is, is you know, money is the gas, cash is the gas. Um, and that while gas is cheap, you really try and get there as quickly as you possibly can. And what you're optimizing for is miles per hour. Mm -hmm. How quickly can I get to my destination? And then when gas becomes more expensive, what we naturally do is we say, one second, I'm going to drive at 50 and optimize for the miles per gallon. If it takes me longer to get there, it takes me longer to get there, but that will be my optimization. And that felt like a, a helpful metaphor because we live that, we do that in our personal decision-making for the changes that we were making at Lemonade. So you suddenly see Lemonade, which has been growing at a certain pace, reduce proactively and tell you in advance, we are about to reduce our pace of growing. Um, and then you say, okay, that makes sense. It's because the cost of growth has gone up. And when that happens, you switch from miles per hour to miles per gallon. We need more fuel efficiency, more capital efficiency at, at the same time. So in that regard, you get to more fuel efficiency. Uh, you start to cut costs in the business. But you can't cut your way 
in the case you're in for sure, but in many cases to profitability, you got to kind of continue growing the business. How, how do you balance that or do you not balance it? I, I think you need kind of the wisdom of Solomon to, to know how to split that. It, it's challenging. It really There's is. another metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it really is challenging. Um, By the way, the references to the story of Solomon and the uh, two supposed mothers of a baby who come to him and uh, each one says, this baby is mine. In order to solve the case, he says, cut the baby in half. And then only the real mother turns up and starts crying. He says, no, 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 save my son. And that's how we know the real mother is. But go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have to be careful with my biblical, biblical references. <laughs> um, I don't know that there's a particularly right answer. And you're taking risks either way. I, I think that's a point I, I, I try to highlight to myself and, and to the team and to, and to you as a board member. Going too slow, by the way, this is true with the gas metaphor as well. Going too slow doesn't optimize for efficiency. It actually becomes more costly. All and you get honked at. <laughs> it's less pleasant, less fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what we're trying to do is um, we have quite a lot of money in the bank for reasons that we touched on earlier. And we want to make the assumption, I think it's a, a, a harsh assumption, not necessarily a right one, but work on the assumption that we're never going to be able to raise another dime again. Um, or that the cost is such that we don't want to raise another dime again. And then think, okay, that's fine. We've got a full tank. Let's just choose our, our path in such a way that will optimize to get to that point um, with money still in the bank, with, with gas still in the tank. So you go too slow, you won't get there. You go too fast, you won't get there. And there's a range of reasonableness within that, and we're trying to operate within that range. I would ask you how it's going so far, but I know you haven't announced results yet this quarter, so I won't do that. Um, I think most people who looked at Lemonade in the early days, and maybe even still today, ask themselves the following question. Is this a for-profit corporation trying to uh, maximize profits? Is this some sort of impact company with three bottom lines? Um, why is there a not-for-profit element here? Shouldn't these be separate? Like, you know, we have a notion in, in the world right now in America of a 501c3 in Israel of a 46a, which those are nonprofits. They can't actually make money. And those guys over there, they're Milton Friedman, have to maximize profits. Um, Lemonade is a different path than both of those. How do you think about that criticism, where it comes from? And does it impact you at all? Do you think differently? It's a great question. And maybe we can spend a few minutes on it. Um. I'll start off with the fact that Lemonade um, is architected at a legal level slightly unusually, not unique, but unusual, and that is that we are a public benefit corporation. And this is a new kind of legal entity. Um, we're, we were formed in Delaware, and Delaware was one of the first states to adopt it, but still, even in Delaware, it's a relatively... My memory is correct. I think it was Virginia who was the first. It could be. I was a signer on an original B Corp document somewhere. There you go. Yeah. Oh, but let me separate between public benefit corporation and B Corp. 100%, yeah. So I'll split the two. But at a foundational level, we're a public benefit corporation rather than an inc. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean, and it can be confusing, and I think the naming sounds almost like a charity. We are not. We are for profit. Unashamedly, proudly, we're about maximizing profit. Being a public benefit corporation um, adds a dimension which says that you may, and under certain, and, and under certain mm -hmm. circumstances, must consider issues beyond just bottom line. And I think of this as more of a shield than anything else, because if you're CEO or board member of a company and you don't want to do something, you don't want to invest in some regime that you think is uh, um, unsavory or in some products that you think are bad or whatever that whatever you think the right thing to do is, you open yourself up to an activist shareholder who will say, hey, Milton Friedman, that's not the right thing to do. If you're a public benefit corporation, you actually have legal protection to say, no, I'm actually, I told you, it's in my founding documents that I will look at these other things. And at times you may think that it's hurting the bottom line, but it's part of my responsibility. And therefore it's fair warning to investors that there may be such circumstances. And you think it's actually helping the bottom line, it should be said. I do. Yeah. I absolutely do. Yeah. But it does provide you with something of a shield against that kind of criticism, which I have to say we've not really received. Mm -hmm. um, then on top of that, we've also become a B Corp, which is then not merely giving you license to do good, but somebody's actually auditing the degree to which you are doing that. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll take your question at a slightly broader level and we'll get a little bit philosophical and maybe even a little bit biblical if you'll allow me. Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> We're sitting here in, in Tel Aviv, Israel, and I think, and you're the scholar here, so you can keep me honest, but the story that I tell myself is that um, 
there is something of a difference, a historical difference between traditional and ancient kind of Christian and Jewish ways about thinking about some of these topics. And I, I think, and I'm no scholar of either religion, but at least of all of, of Christianity, but nevertheless, I think about the early teachings of uh, um, St. Augustine and others talking about the fall of man. And then all the way through to uh, uh, Martin Luther and his thoughts about this. And you get to a picture that is, you asked me before about do I trust in the goodness of man or, or not? It's a fairly bleak perspective about um, this natural state of humanity and the need of grace in order to redeem them, but left to their own devices, it's a pretty sorry state of affairs. Doctrine of original sin. Yeah, That's right. Um, and while Judaism is based on similar biblical sources, it didn't, and, and you'll find echoes of that in Jewish teachings, that's not a central theme in, in Jewish thought. And the central theme in Jewish thought is actually much more um, engaged with a lot of human nature and nature in general. And you see the differences that each religion took in its attitude towards sex or towards food or towards a lot of other ways of engaging in nature and your basic attitude towards natural desires. Um, and I say that in this context, I'll try and bring it back in, but um, I, I think the dichotomy that we have in the legal structure between for-profit and not-for-profit, which is at the core of your question, comes back to this. It is actually rooted in a deep suspicion of greed and of any natural inclination. And if I think your inclinations are inherently evil, then if you're pursuing them, you must be doing something bad. And if you want to do something good, then you mustn't get anything for yourself out of it. It has to be selfless in the, in the pristine way. And therefore, I create two different legal structures, one for people who want to make money, one for people who don't want to make money. Um, I don't know if that was ever true. It's certainly not in the teachings and that bringing that I received. And I, I think increasingly we're seeing opportunities to meld the two. And you spoke about Milton Friedman, but Adam Smith already pointed to this idea that the invisible hand, the idea that the baker can be pursuing something that serves him and his family and yet is good for society. So these ideas entered Western thought quite recently and in other traditions they've been enmeshed in, in the thinking for a much, much longer period of time. Render unto God that which is to God and unto Caesar or Rome that which is to them is kind of ancient, you know, I've often thought about Adam Smith that we've forgotten actually what Adam Smith says. So there's the invisible hand and the baker and the brewer. Um, but Adam Smith grows up in and is active in Protestant Scotland in which there is actually a community infrastructure that exists by virtue of religion, Protestantism. And um, so a lot of the assumptions that you make in the lemonade model in addition to the kind of more merged, maybe Jewish bent on it, actually has a lot to do with Adam Smithism uh, as well, which is he assumes this community infrastructure that holds people honest in smaller communities. And then the brewer and the baker, in improving their own lot, uh, move the economy forward. And by the way, move the people around them forward uh, as well. And it raises the question in my mind, so Lemonade's built effectively a community around this by, by rallying people around charities. Uh, you've built a community that brings out better spirits. How important do you think it is for the positive, profitable financial growth of businesses to actually build a community around these companies? It's not just love of the brand, but it's almost love of the other people who are customers of this company because together we can accomplish something more. And then, you know what, maybe I'll add a second question on top of it. No, actually, go ahead. <laughs> you know, just to add to it, people share, like, your give back day. It's, like, crazy viral. I'm part of this group of good people doing good things. You know, it's lovable and friendly and 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 entertaining, too, the way you do it. You give, but, but people share it, and they're proud yeah. to be a part of the group of people who gave to the Red Cross, the American yeah. Cancer Society, whatever the case may be. Definitely. I, and I think this taps into my... The reason for my optimism and the reason why I think today more than ever your quip about values creating value is true and the arc of history is on its favor, and I'll, I'll explain. It ties back into kind of Maslow. So at a time that we don't have the most basic housing and, you know, the calories are scarce, people are not going to have the 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 space in their mind to think about some of these charity or other things, or they may not. They're really hunkered down, taking care of basics. 
But technology has driven incredible abundance in the world, just incredible abundance. And I think not coincidentally, younger generations who grew up with greater abundance are being more thoughtful, more engaged, more demanding on the ethical side as well. Suddenly, if Nike is using a sweatshop, and they may have done that for God knows how many years before, but suddenly it's absolutely unacceptable and they're going to get boycotted and exposed and terrible things are going to happen. And that repeats itself time and time and time again. Businesses that are making money by doing something that their consumers perceive as being evil is something that they may have once got away with and they absolutely cannot get away with anymore. The world is more transparent in general. Absolutely. The world is more transparent and I think less forgiving in a good way. And what I mean by that is, I mean, also in a bad way, but the good way that I wanted to touch on is that I, I think this is part of climbing the Maslow scale. I'm no longer just okay with having comfortable shorts. I want to know that those comfortable shorts are not at the expense of some kid in some distant land. And that means that part of the value proposition, part of the brand promise of any business, including insurance, has to be I'm aligned with you on a values level. And if I'm not, then I'm not giving you the full product experience, the full brand experience. You will actually not want to engage with me, which is why over time values create value. And that, interesting that, yeah. you know, there, there was a book written by Vivek, uh, blanking his last name, called Woke Inc., which I haven't read yet, but it's on my night table, uh, which kind of slams, I would call, the... Uh, wokeism or cancel culture that's coming all out of these uh, companies. Uh, when Ben and Jerry's decided to uh, pull their products or their license from the Israeli distributor, I actually wrote that I thought it was a good thing. I actually wanted to know the product I was buying and who the people behind it were. Um, my sense is people feel the same thing about lemonade. Where do you l- land on this divide between this can kind of run itself amok to your point, you know, transparency could cause a lot of really negative things and, and canceling and, and woke versus Transparency can let me, you know, align with the products that I really care about. One of the the nice things about the old thing of for profit and not for profit was it was very clean. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're entering murkier waters and and in many ways unforgiving times in a bad sense. And and people who misstep get slammed in, in ways that are um very harsh indeed. So I, I definitely think that these are dangerous waters and and in that sense dangerous times. At Lemonade with taking the approach in, in many ways, but this as well, that we'd rather generate strong emotions and love from a minority of people than just peter out and be kind of average for everybody. And that taking a, sta- a stand on some issues will engender counter measures or, or sometimes hate or whatever. We took a, sta- a stand after a terrible massacre in Vegas a few years ago. We decided that as an insurance company that insures guns and insures um, the liability of the gun holder as well, we can't be neutral on this topic. We have to come to a view. Passivity is, by implication, taking a position, so we might as well be thoughtful about the position. And we put on some constraints on the guns that we were going to insure. We didn't want to insure assault rifles, and we said we'll insure up to $2,500 worth of guns, but if you're go beyond that. And by the way, we're going to condition coverage on the gun being responsibly used and securely stored, none of which are, are done by any other insurance company to the best of my knowledge. It shouldn't be that controversial at the end of the day. You would have but thought it was. Not. It right. was, and it included hate mail saying, you know, I hope the next massacre is in Lemonade's offices and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so we knew that it would be a lightning rod for some negativity, but I think overall that's the kind of stuff that a lot of people can get behind and respect. And you pay a price, but you also get a benefit. I think the point you made, by the way, that passivity is also a stance is poorly understood by most people. There's this notion in, in many ways that uh, being conservative or something like that uh, or not taking a stand uh, protects you. I, I find it's exactly the opposite. It, that is actually a decision. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, over the short term, sometimes it's safer, but over the long time, it's a far more risky decision. And I want to move to kind of a rapid fire uh, round of questions now. So I came back 10 days ago from uh, an IPO of a company called Fredos that happens, the CEO name happens to be Schreiber also. Yeah, we're related. You're related, married. right? It's, it's, yeah. it's your brother. You shame the share, you share the same parents. You shame the same, that's what I meant by marriage. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, what did your parents do or 
What did they feed you when you were young that there's two CEOs of public companies now? This is a rapid fire question. The, and, and, <laughs> and, and well, I've met your parents. I love them. They're wonderful people. They're with us at the IPO at, at NASDAQ. I'm on the board of that company too, for full disclosure. So I've made a winning bet in your parents. Uh, what did they do? What was it like growing up? Gosh, I don't, I don't think that qualifies as a rapid fire question. That's kind okay. of a sit on the, I will the, think for a minute on the two. couch and talk for the next three years or Ouch. whatever, but yeah. Um, but the short answer I think has to be that we grew up in, in an environment, you know, our, our grandparents were all immigrants. Um, my grandfather names, not names, but the Schreiber grandfather was, um, very entrepreneurial. So was my other grandfather. Um, they came as penniless refugees and orphans to the UK from, um, other places in Europe just ahead of the Nazi machine that really decimated all of their families. Uh, three out of my four grandparents were orphaned and made uh, penniless refugees. So that, I, I'm sure if we had longer to explore and you'd understand that, you know, that kind of thing that instills in people. And then at a very young age, we grew up in a home that was also entrepreneurial. My dad was a businessman and at age two, I moved from the UK to the US because he was going to Stanford and working in HP in the early 70s and then back and I've moved around and moving countries and being a bit nomadic and being exposed to different things forges a, a sense of um, risk perspective and perception, etc. So I think we've always been encouraged to be creative and to think in entrepreneurial ways. And I'm sure that's part of the part of the story. Now, you mentioned your grandparents. Uh, I just lost my grandmother at uh, almost 100 years old. I know your grandfather lived a very, very long life uh, uh, as well. I don't know how old he was when he when he passed. Um, how important is it for your kids to have had great grandparents around? Wow, what a wonderful question. Um, my grandmother is alive and well at 99. She turns 100 in June. Um, and she's a central feature in the lives of all of us. There's no question. Um, and it, it's striking because my kids have, and I'm now a grandfather and I know you've experienced this as well, but being able to see your grandmother hold your grandchild is just unbelievable. These unbelievable. Powerful, powerful um, images and forces. Um, and my grandmother, much as I know I remember your grandmother well, she was a powerful matriarch, and mine is as well. And we all look to her and draft off of her strength and the love and encouragement that she gives. She knows all of her descendants, and they are numerous. <laughs> she knows them all very well and by name, and all of us are lulled into the sense that we have a particularly special relationship with her. <laughs> There's almost 200 of us, you know. But no, what I have is particularly unique. My, my kids feel that way, absolutely. Uh, how do you think it affects them? I'm not sure. Um, you know, when, when our eldest had his son, it was really important for him to get on a plane and go and visit his great-grandmother and show her her great-great-grandson. In London? In London. Yeah. And for her, this was probably her 50th great-great-grandson, and she was thrilled to see him. But for him, it was really important, and he traveled with a newborn infant to London in order to, to show my grandmother. Yeah. So th these are central themes in their lives, but I, I wouldn't care to characterize them exactly. Yeah. One of the last pictures we have of my grandmother is her holding my youngest granddaughter. And it's, it's a meaningful picture. Yeah. And it, it's, I feel like she achieved almost eternity through these kind of generations that came after. All right, now we'll move on to rapid fire. For real. <laughs> so um, what's the problem in the world that you most want to fix? You can't see, but he, his eyes opened wide and deep breath. And Yeah, yeah. I exhaled into the mic. Um, <laughs> I guess the one that I'm most focused on is uh, poverty. Um, it sounds um, uh, to me a little ludicrous to say that that's a problem that I want to fix, but I, I want to play a part in fixing it, I guess, or reducing it. What makes you human and vulnerable? Wow. Um, I, I think I'm very human and vulnerable. I tend to wear my feelings out of my sleeve. I think what you see is what you get. Um, I cry in movies. I'm moved by my kids and my grandkids. I have, I have, um, I, I, my family is, is a, my wife of 30 years, Daniela and, and my kids are a focal point in my life in a way that's just becoming more and more powerful. So I, I guess I would have to say that. The first time I invested in you was in Alchemy Media. I want to come back to that one second, the rapid fire. We sold it for a little bit of money. Um, 
it wasn't a success in a meaningful way, but you kept at this entrepreneurial thing. Why didn't you give up? You know, I took a long break. I know. I came out of that. I had to wait all those years to yeah. invest again. <laughs> I came out of that experience. Um, you know, I, it was, we, we founded that company in 97, I want to say, maybe 96, thereabouts. And it was a wonderful time in the sense that um, if you had no experience, <laughs> that was a, a necessary condition for getting invested in in those crazy dot-com days. So I, I qualified. And it gave me. It was true for being an investor. Yeah, too, <laughs> like we, we both benefited from that. <laughs> Timing is everything. Um, so it, it was a school of hard knocks from which I, I I graduated and learned so so much. But I also came out bruised in those early days. You know, I spoke now about being able to weather the stock market and all that kind of stuff and see things coming and raising money ahead of time. But those were the schools of hard, hard knocks that taught me that. And when I came out of that, I didn't keep going. I actually took a job in a traditional yeah. company and spent some time in entre entrepreneurship rather than entrepreneurship. It took me a while to to find my sea legs again and get back out there. How do you want to be remembered at the end of your life? I don't have any illusions of grandeur. I don't expect to be remembered in the broad world in, in any meaningful way. I'm not, I'm not structuring my lifestyle in order to achieve that. Um, but I do hope that my loved ones think of me fondly. Uh, I'd like them to, when they think of me, to, to bring a smile to their face. And if I achieve that, I'll, I'll feel good about it. In 100 years, they'll write a biography of Daniel Schreiber. Somebody will. What should the title be? Yeah, I, I, I deny the premise. I, I, I'm not living a life that will warrant a biography in 100 years. But I know, but everyone's writing biographies about their parents and grandparents now. So. I see, I see. <laughs> so, so what should the title Chat be? GPC will. will. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that one. Wow. Okay, so I'll bring you back. That's normally how we end, but now we can't lend. And like, so I'll come back to something else. So we met 30-something uh, years ago. We were both 18 or 19 years old. I was 18. Uh, in an institution that you referred to as Haratzion, sometimes referred to as the Gush. Those are formative years. What is something you took away from that time? I know what I took away from it, um, that those two or three years... Uh, there that you carry with you today? That one I actually know the answer to. Um, it'll sound odd, but I discovered that I'm smart. Interesting. Yeah. I. You mentioned earlier my older brother, who, whose IPO um, just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm second um, chronologically to him. We're six siblings. Um, and there's only 18 or so months between us. So I was kind of, we grew up pretty much together. And he is incredibly sharp. <laughs> he is just incredibly sharp. We lived in Palo Alto as young kids, and he was being written about in the HP publications because at age, I don't know, six or five or whatever, with these computers such as they were at the time, he was writing programs. He was just extraordinary. Um, and that can be kind of intimidating. Um, and my protection was to not try. And I went through my schooling being lovable and friendly and people, you know, had good relationships. But academically, I never exerted myself. And my mom would come back distraught from parent-teacher conferences because it was the old thing about, you know, the, the child is capable but he isn't applying himself kind of thing. And I ended up getting just about good enough grades exiting school to go to university, but it was touch and go. And it, it was a huge surprise and relief to my family that I got adequate grades and they were by no means great grades. Um, and when we are, when I we left school and left the oversight and kind of forged out on my own and went to a different country into this college, and it's a, it's a yeshiva or a college of incredibly rigorous intellectual environment. Um, I went to a top university afterwards, and I, I think it's much more demanding intellectually than anything that I encountered otherwise. Um, and in that environment, for the, really for the first time in my life, I discovered that I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other people of, of substantial intellect. And I discovered my intellectual capabilities, such as they are, I discovered them there and I was kind of blind to them beforehand. That's super interesting. We shared then something else in common. <laughs> in the ninth grade, my father went to parent-teacher conference with my rabbi in the ninth grade who told him, your son is the biggest waste of potential I've seen. <laughs> so uh, with that... You can find Daniel at Lemonade.com. I'm sorry, you can find Lemonade at Lemonade.com. And you can find Daniel on Twitter at D-A-Schreiber, D-A-S-C-H-R-E-I-B-E-R. 
If you enjoyed this podcast and my conversation with my not old friend, but good friend of many years, Daniel Schreiber, please rate us five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever else you listen to this podcast. Daniel, thank you for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Wonderful. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.